About two years ago, I was in a bookstore browsing through the religion aisle. And religion has always fascinated me. I've always felt called since I was a young girl, you know, to seek out spiritual truth or, or meaning in my life, make sense of things. And, you know, my path, or should I say paths, you know, in and out of religious and spiritual practices and traditions has not been a straight and narrow one, but very wide and winding and full of bumps and beautiful gifts. But in that bookstore, my path took another turn as I looked and saw a book on the Catholic shelf called Building a Bridge how the Catholic Church and the LGBT community can enter into a relationship of respect, compassion, and sensitivity. And the book, written by Father James Martin, grabbed my attention in a way that very few things Catholic had in a very long time. So I opened it, and on the first page was a passage from the book of Psalms, number 139. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My eyes welled with tears, and I actually sat on the floor of the bookstore holding this book. It had been ages since I'd picked up anything having to do with Catholicism or a Bible, and it had been even longer since I'd done so by choice and actually felt at peace upon reading what was in front of me. Something about that psalm shook me inside and, and shifted my consciousness, my sense of my own faith. A few months before I found the book, uh, I had attended Easter Vigil Mass with my grandmother for the first time in years, and something had shifted in me then as well. I think maybe it was the chant, you know, the beautiful singing of the Kyrie and the Gloria from the choir lofts or the, or the familiarity of being with my grandma in my childhood church, but something about it caused me to feel such a great sense of uneasiness. And it was an uneasiness that I think was not born of discomfort, but really of comfort at the strangeness of how comfortable I was in a place that had caused at times like such great pain. And I think I stifled that feeling until I opened Father Martin's book and I could no longer ignore uh, a yearning to return, you know, and, and a yearning that existed alongside such a fear to return as well. His book caused me to recall my childhood in the church. You know, for the first time in my life, I came to realize that things I thought of as secular concerns always were and forever will be deeply Catholic. My most formative fundamental beliefs surrounding justice, kindness, compassion, love, and liberation were formed in Catholic school against the backdrop of scriptures, of the mass, and the lives of the saints. And that's what I cling to, those formative values, those ideas that are not just good things that we come up with, but divinely ordained ideas that we should be moving towards always. And that is what I fight every toxic and damaging act of rejection with. The radical action and love that our scriptures and our Christ repeatedly call for when we humans get it wrong. So I don't have it all together, but what I do know is that when I made my way back to a church and heard the choir and felt the organ shake the walls, I felt I'd come home, albeit with a new understanding of what home is and means for me, I have learned over the years that home can be found in an endless number of places and feelings and that the arms of a woman is one of them and so is the embrace of our God. I had to realize that it's all holy, it's all sacred, and that all of this anger and this rage that we hold about the state of our church is worthy and necessary. I am queer and Catholic, and neither queerness nor Catholicism is confined to a pride parade or a pew. Welcome to Taberton, everybody.
That story was by Vine and Fig community member Jordan Kennedy. Welcome to Tabard In, y'all, a weekly podcast about the stories we tell and the events we discuss while on pilgrimage as queer Catholics worthy of love at home and at church. I'm Jacob Flores, baptized this past Easter, dog dad, Ariana Grande stan, and lover of Anglican High Church Choirs. Who are you? <laughs> I'm his fiance, Pat Gothman. Uh, I pursued celibacy for 10 years until I realized that you can't choose celibacy merely out of fear and loathing, and so I went and found a hot co-host and convinced him to marry me. Oh. <laughs> so, hot co-host, what have we got on the podcast today? Today we've got something pretty special and a little different. We interviewed James Allison. He is a British-born Catholic priest and theologian, one of the few openly gay priests out there. He has spent years trying to tell the truth about the dignity of queer lives in the church, um, and what seemed so marginal when he first started talking about this over 30 years ago, uh, now increasingly seems mainstream. Yeah, so he is an incredible priest. He has been working on acceptance for queer folks in the church for a really long time, and he was even laicized by the Vatican for his work until Pope Francis called him recently and told him to get back to work. So we talked to him about what it is like to have the Pope call his cell phone, which is a crazy experience. I can't imagine that ever happening. I'm a good millennial and I never answer the phone, so I'm sure he would never get through anyway. Uh, what he thinks Pope Francis really wants for queer people within the church, why he thinks that the gay issue is much more of an emotional issue for the church to deal with rather than a theological one, what unique spiritual gifts he thinks queer Catholics have, and a whole lot more. So what you're saying is you should answer those unknown numbers. Those unknown numbers just might be the Pope because he told us that it was a blocked call and it was the Pope on the other end. Yikes. <laughs> and um, as always, we'll end the episode by toasting our biggest inspirations this week. Uh, you can find us at Vine and Fig Co. on social media and at vineandfig.co on the web. Uh, James spoke with us from his home in Madrid, so there's a couple moments where we stepped on each other due to the lag, uh, and we do apologize for that. But without further ado, here is James Allison. All righty, well, James Allison, welcome to Tabard Inn. So you are a theologian, a Catholic priest, an out gay man, and an advocate for full LGBTQ inclusion in the church, aspects which both to many outside the church and inside the Catholic church probably appear contradictory. So what do you feel like is kind of holding you together? Wow. Well, I guess it's because um, what I've understood and what I try to explain and teach is that if we actually go to what is basic in Christianity about Jesus, why he came, uh, what he did for us, what he does for us, why he gave us the Holy Spirit, it's kind of so obviously gay-friendly that, as it were, the mystery is why people are still fooled by all the clerical um, <laughs> fuss budgetary um, concerning, uh, concerning matters gay, why they find it so difficult to see that as all the deeper melodies of the Catholic faith are very obviously gay-friendly. So yeah, that's what keeps me going. Where it keeps me going in the sense that, hey, this is all about people like us. It's obvious that we're on the inside of this. Now we've just got to try and make sure that the uh, icing matches the cake. <laughs> so do you think um, the clericalism is what gets in the way of people fully understanding and kind of allowing the mostly journey. yeah i mean uh, what what i observed um over the years of dealing with this is how incredibly quickly the catholic faithful um particularly in catholic majority countries uh move on on this issue the moment it becomes clear that being gay is just something that some people are people say okay yep in that case obviously they've got to be who they are to the best of their possible capacity and that's that so the, the speed with which, for instance, in Spain, in Argentina, in Brazil, Mexico, uh, the laity understood the ordinariness of gay people and how they're basically part of all our families. And of course, naturally, if you love family, you want your gay son, nephew, brother, uncle, or whatever, you want his or her significant other to be part of your family. And that's been uh, the way it's worked. So that if you look at opinion polls in the United States and other countries, typically the Catholic faithful, when polled, are above average in their, and they're above the average of the population in terms of their 
gay friendliness. What do you what do you think um, it says about the church that the, the 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 faithful, the regular folks in the pews are kind of leading on this issue? I guess because um, most of them are straight, and therefore they're not uh, tortured by the issue <laughs> in the way that so many of the clergy are. Given that the majority, certainly of the higher clergy, is gay, and the majority of the higher clergy who are gay are dealing with. Uh, or other, or are sometimes failing to deal with uh, issues of their own honesty surrounding uh, surrounding this, and get caught in a trap. So, so because, it's very, very difficult. It's very difficult to be out as a gay priest, and much more as a gay bishop, even though most bishops are gay. Uh, you know, it's people who are able to be honest about it, who are able to talk about these things, and they're people who are able to talk about things, are able to deal with them relationally rather than intellectually. What was it like when you came out publicly as a gay priest? Well, I'm honestly not sure what's meant by that because, I mean, I was out throughout the time, I mean, from the time I entered into religious life and so at the time of my ordination, I mean, I was I was out to my family, I was out to my friends, uh, I was out within the congregation. I mean, I, I was working in Brazil with AIDS, mm -hmm. people with AIDS, so I was even outed by the archbishop uh, to my pleasure, simply by him telling other people that I was working with people with AIDS, whereas my own community had asked me not to uh, let people know that I was gay on the grounds that it might cause scandal. But in fact, the Archbishop outed me as working with people with AIDS, which at that time meant if you worked with people with AIDS, then you were clearly gay. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the, the so-called simple faithful who were thought by my superiors likely to be scandalized, were immediately delighted and came to me and said, hey, James, come and give us a talk about this, that, the other. And, you know, so <laughs> it's always the reverse. The, the frightened closeted are always frightened as to how much worse it's going to go than it does in fact go with regards to the simple faithful. <laughs> so you were out. Oh, yeah, no, I've, been, I've, been, I've been out and had endless battles precisely because, you know, if, you're, uh, if you attempt to speak with something approaching honesty and with something approaching a desire for justice in this area, you really, really rattle the, uh, the ship. I mean, you're, it's, uh, what's the word? In Spanish, they say, um, you're, you're putting your finger in the wound. Mm, yeah. Um, because, because you're touching the issue about which no one dares to talk. So, I mean, uh, okay, I was, yeah. So the question is not, uh, when I was honest, but what I learned mm -hmm. it was only it was only rather later, like at the age of thirty five uh, when i 'd already been six years a priest that I actually finally accepted myself completely as, as realizing that no i 'm not a screwed up straight person, <laughs> <laughs> and my love is not distorted and sick sick love, but the real thing so I guess it 's from about six years into my priesthood that I was genuinely in good conscience, if you like beautiful about being a a gay, a gay man. Mm -hmm. When and so when you were laicized, where did you find the most support? Um, and uh, in contrast, uh, where were the most? Oh, the, form, the formal laicization. The formal laicization didn't happen until oh three four years ago, nineteen to twenty fifteen. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about the document is that it actually says that you shouldn't tell people, you shouldn't give sc a scandal by telling people about mm -hmm. it. Um, the document is specifically addressed to the archdiocese that did the that did the laicizing. But so I only told people on a need to know basis uh, because I didn't want to cause scandal. I mean, one of the easy things to do would have been to make a fuss about it and go to the press and all that uh, and present myself as a victim and all that, which seems to me to be exactly the wrong thing to do. Um, so I only told people whom I didn't want to get into trouble, given that they'd invited me to. Uh, preside, for instance, in their parish, or so I said. Listen, are you sure? Are you really sure you want to go ahead with this? And that was when, in the case of one of them, and these are often Jesuits, wise old Jesuits, who said, ah, "Pay no attention to that. Uh, it would be far, far more scandalous were you to tell people about this and obey it than for you to carry on as normal." So yeah, no, but I, I, I mean, I wasn't supported by many people because not many people knew. I kept the quest, the question quiet, precisely so as not to, yeah, as not to cause scandal and not to get into a, one of those, you know, 
victimary. So it was a bit of its own closet that you were you were put in uh, uh, by the Vatican, but this time about your your own status as a priest. I was about yeah, but uh, you know, I'm sure that they just think of it as a legal matter, and that's it. They're, sure. they're not concerned with anybody's uh, anybody's real life. Um, but so that lasted for less than eighteen months because the moment I uh, my former novice master, who was a bishop, the moment I chatted with him about, it, he said, "Oh, I'm, this is ridiculous." Um, and he offered to uh, seek a private audience with the Holy Father. So from that moment, and he said to me, really, you just should, should treat this as nonsense. I mean, pay no attention to it. Um, yeah, so recently you wrote about the time it, that Pope Francis called you in and restored you to full ministry as a priest, and he had some incredibly moving words for you. Uh, can you share a little bit about yeah. what he said uh, for any of our listeners who may not have read the article where yes. you outlined some of that? Yeah, well, and of course, it's better in Spanish. So I'll say it both in Spanish and in English. Okay, great. <laughs> so the phone the phone rings with a, one of those hidden number things. Um, so I don't know who's calling. And I answer it, and he, the voice says, Soy el Papa Francisco. I'm Pope Francis. And so I then say in Spanish, En serio? Seriously? Uh, and he says, No, en broma, hijo. No, just kidding, son. <laughs> Which is very good. It suggests to me that he's had a similar reaction to others when he's run them up. <laughs> um, but then he said, um, when he was clear that it was me and he'd been looking at my my letter, because um, my former novice master, now bishop, had taken a, a letter from me to him in which I'd explained that I'd uh, received this letter in Latin, forcibly laicizing me, and it was incompatible with his own stated views on the kind of apostolate that I'd been doing. And so I said, I I honestly don't know which one of these two is genuinely you and therefore which I should obey. And I've, I'm going for the your public statements rather than the Latin document version, but I expose my conscience to you. So you tell me which you it was sure. <laughs> um, who's been talking, which is a uh, something I learned from the Jesuits. The Jesuits have a thing called exposure of conscience, where if there's something you you genuinely don't know what to do. You expose your conscience to the superior. So that would have been something that I know he's familiar with. And so he looked at the letter, and it was clearly it was clearly him because he had the letter, which was private. Uh, and he said, "Mire, yo quiero que camines con plena libertad interior. I want you to walk with full interior freedom, uh, siguiendo en el espíritu de Jesús, following in the um, or maybe he said caminando en el espíritu de Jesús, walking in the spirit of Jesus." Y te doy el poder de las llaves, and I give you the power of the keys. ¿Me entiendes? Do you understand me? Te doy el poder de las llaves. So he repeated that twice, just as, because he was clearly making a point. And so, of course, I said that I understood, which I didn't really, um, because if the Pope says, do you understand? <laughs> How else do you Right, reply? exactly. Uh, so he then we went on to talk about other things. Um, but... Um, you know what? At the very least, what I deduced from that was that it meant that he was treating me as a priest, and that he was giving me uh, what they called universal jurisdiction to hear confessions. And that's because I, I don't know whether this is commonly known, but if you are ordained a priest, um, the ability to preside at mass comes with ordination, but the ability to uh, absolve in confession uh, is a, a juridical matter for which you need jurisdiction, theoretically, from the bishop, or if you're a member of a religious order, from the religious superior. Um, so he was effectively saying, listen, I'm giving that to you wherever you are, so you don't need to worry about the fact that you don't have either a bishop or a religious superior. Yeah, so he knew you were kind of in a, a neverland, uh, an in-between exactly. area, and, and he, he stepped in to, uh, to He stepped in to provide what was lacking there. in limbo, as it were. Yeah. So curiously, he didn't. He what he he didn't do, and it's worth saying that he didn't do what I'd asked him to do, which was to regularize my situation, which would have been to say, "I will now find you someone to whom you can belong, and we'll set up the whole canonical system." He said, "Okay, I can see that." Uh, effectively, he was saying, "Okay, you're in limbo. This is how you carry on doing what you're doing. Be free. Be an adult. Carry on doing what you're doing. I trust your discretion." I, I'm, which is very remarkable. Yeah, that is, and I'm. I'm Curious, even just on a basic level, like like yeah, I know you were translating for, or you know, saying 
telling us what he spoke in Spanish, but uh, what does he sound like on the phone? Like, how does how does he talk? I think there's we see this very um, almost uh, a magisterial uh, version of him when we see him on on TV, and 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 uh, he just seems very far away. But you got this very intimate version of him. What was that like? Oh, um, curiously, he was exactly like what I had assumed he would be from um, from TV, because I, I don't see him as a distant magisterial figure. That I would, I would see someone like Ratzinger as a distant magisterial figure. But no, he was, I suppose it's because I understand Spanish quite well. So I, I'm aware of him having had conversations with people, and I'm aware of how jovial he is uh, in Spanish. So he was jovial. I mean, he was an, he's an elderly Argentinian gentleman, <laughs> and he's jovial. And he was very good humoured throughout. Uh, but he was, you know, he was quite careful. He looked through the uh, my my letter and looked at various points and saw people we had in common and made jokes. But so yes, I was in a sense I was delighted to see that that he is exactly what he sees, what you see, and what I had picked up. I was talking to a very jovial elderly Argentinian Jesuit superior who just happened to be Pope. <laughs> um, and yes, he was in he was in good humor, and he was dealing with something in a very straightforward and deliberate manner. I didn't understand immediately how straightforward and deliberately. In other words, it didn't. It only it took time for me to kick in that this is what the First Vatican Council meant by an immediate act of the universal ordinary. In other words, it uh, escapes canon law. So, having s- spoken um, with the the Pope on the phone, uh, what do you think he? honestly wants for queer Catholics and for the church when it comes to LGBTQ issues? Well, first of all, I think that he is, and this is simply what I got in the very few minutes we talked, I think that he's completely aware uh, of quite how problematic the issue is and has been for uh, for for us living the faith. Um, the sense, I mean, more than that, he certainly didn't say uh, to me other than that he was aware and he had been aware since his time in Buenos Aires about this. The sense I'm getting from how he copes with, with me, uh, with Juan Carlos Cruz, <clears throat> with Jim Martin, um, how he's cope, coped with uh, the Martel book, um, is basically he's very relaxed about about this, and he's saying effectively, and I hope I'm not putting words in his mouth. Listen, this is a complicated uh, matter which raises a great deal of tension and hysteria amongst, particularly closeted and rigid Catholics. So I can hold the, go- the doors open for you to go and do what you uh, what you need to do. So don't ask my permission, just get on with things. Create reality on the ground while I'm hoping while I'm keeping the doors open. <laughs> so that's that's the impression I get I get from him. I, the um, I mean why I think that with some history is that I'm aware that in the first synod meeting, so the 2014 synod meeting, there was an attempt by the organizers, I think with his backing, to get the gay thing dealt with positively. And there was a huge row in the in the synod hall, which of course was kept from the public, um, by several of the most homophobic and reactionary bishops and cardinals, really, really frighteningly violent. And I think that he realized, and other people realize, is, is as we've seen in all the other denominations that have dealt with this <laughs> issue, it's not something that can be talked about rationally for certain people. It It's too much of a trigger. So my sense is that since then, he has thought, okay, this is something that's got to be dealt with by slippage. In other words, it's if you face if you uh, do it face on, then you give the the allergic to the chance to bloviate. So it's got to be done by slippage, which means that as people get used to it being normal to talk about this, so the weight of the old fashioned homophobic closeted guys becomes less, and so you start getting bishops and priests who are able to say in public the kind of things that bishops and priests have now started saying in public all over the place, which is, yes, we've got to look at this. Yes, we need to have gay-friendly pastoral set up in our diocese. No, we won't only accept courage as being the the one single model of, of right. Catholic pastoral. Yes, it's perfectly obvious that we're heading towards understanding 
uh, LGBT married people. And I think that throughout the world, I think that curiously, the most difficult place for that is is the U.S. Um, strangely, yeah, there's uh, some quite vocal back- because, <laughs> backlash, isn't there? Well, and I, it, yes, it, I think that's because the the terrible, terrible policy which was started by John Paul, or that John Paul was either fooled into doing, but um, certainly went along with, of appointing culture war bishops in the basically running the first along the first things model of an alliance between right wing Catholics and evangelicals to make a Republican Party friendly moralistic right. Catholicism uh, as as opposed to a Democratic Party friendly social Catholicism and that was quite clearly what the what the program was and you know Chapu and Cardinal George and others were, were the were the poster boys for that and boy have they run the the roost for the last 30 years so the result is that your bishop's conference is engaged in all sorts of horrendous you know legal cases to try and allow themselves to discriminate against people where more and more throughout the world bishops are realizing that actually that is the death of the church being locked into the right to discriminate against gay and lesbian people especially given that most of the bishops are themselves yeah. gay and lesbian people well, not those <laughs> so I, th- I, th- I think I think there is I think there is a big shift going on, but I think that it's it's got a much tougher time coming in the U.S. Sure, absolutely. So I'd like to uh, ask you a few questions about uh, theology, as you're a, a theologian, if that's all right. So the Catholic oh, Church often says that the biggest reason a same-sex couple cannot get married is because they cannot naturally conceive children together, and that being open to children is an essential part of marriage. So why are you not convinced by that? Well, because I think that the key question in marriage, as I understand it, is not the procreation issue, but the uh, until death issue. Remember the um, the principal image we have of marriage, according to St. Paul, is Jesus giving himself out of love up till death for his spouse, the church. So that's, if you like, that's the reality. And what we call marriage is supposed to be the sign of that. So the central difference, if you like, between simple secular marriage and baptized marriage, which is what, after all, I mean, Christianity. It was a long time. It took a long time before marriage was recognised as a sacrament within Christianity, and when it was recognised as a sacrament, it was recognised because it was baptism that turned the secular reality into a Christian one. And the whole point of the baptism is the dying with Christ in advance, so as to be able to live his life forever. In other words, it's the up to death part that's key. Now, it doesn't seem to me that there is any reason at all why the gender of a couple matters in that. It's perfectly true that straight people who are incapable of children can be married precisely because they can make (laughs) a a promise to love, honour, worship and obey, or whatever the language in the marriage rite is, each other, (laughs) up till death, until death do us part, is the famous famous phrase. So that's what seems to me to be key uh, in marriage. Now, it's interesting that the uh, the American right-wing uh, attackers of gay marriage said, ah, oh, but that's just about friendship, not about marriage. Well, uh, they need to study, uh, you know, what Ratzinger and others have been saying about marriage. No, that's the key thing about marriage, not friendship. They want procreation to be the central feature of marriage, but it's not, never has been. As you know, it would it, that would render null uh, a huge variety of marriages in which it turns out that childbearing is impossible. So uh, that's the, my, the first point is simply that. Now, the second point is, and I'm simply not sure of what this is to be in the future. Civil marriage is now a reality in many countries in the world between same-sex couples. and it's, it's a reality in the United States. It's a reality even in Texas where you live. Um, in fact, Texas, I think, was rather an important state in the overcoming of some of the anti-gay legislation. It was probably called Lawrence yeah, versus exactly. Texas. Is that right? That was one of the key, one of the key uh, law changes. Okay, for me, what I'm really interested in is discovering, and I don't think we're going to be able to do this quickly. 
what gay marriage means, what marriage between two people of the same sex means. Civil marriage is perfectly obvious. There are a set of civil realities like uh, visiting rights, uh, inheritance rights, pension rights, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that are being the near being the nearest of kin rights, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that are resolved by civil marriage. What we don't know, and I think, as I say, this is something that will take time because it will depend on people like you two, um, <laughs> is what is it exactly that same-sex couples are bearing witness to? What is the blessing to which you are bearing witness so that we can bless God for blessing us through how God has blessed you, which is what's central to marriage? You know, The marriage ceremony is a ceremony in which the community gathers together to bless God for the blessing that God has given the couple and the blessing that that couple, by witnessing to God's love, is giving to the community. That's the, if you like, that's the, the nature of the wedding ceremony, liturgically speaking. So I'm not sure that we yet have practical jurisprudence, and by that I mean lived experience, of people for whom getting married was something that they could imagine ever since they were a little kid and started discovering that they were dreaming of Prince Charming <laughs> rather than Cinderella <laughs> um, uh, or whoever, you know. Um, so it's, it's kids who have always been able to imagine themselves getting married and who have started to date at approximately at the same time as their straight classmates and, and so on and so forth. In other words, for whom there has been a certain normality in as far as uh, a minority uh, is ever going to be normality, what it actually means, what is it that they're doing and what is it that they're bearing witness to. So I personally don't want to hurry that process. I don't want people to come up with a definition of what same-sex marriage is, what sort of sacramentality it is, until we have enough evidence from people who are living it and the people who know and love them. So, if you like, it seems to me that exactly what the shape of the sacrament is in the case of same-sex couples, I don't know. And I don't think that any of us knows. And I think that it's going to be your generation of married couples who are going to be able to bear witness to what God's spousal love for us looks like. And that's, of course something that we're going to all be uh, having to learn, which is why I'm so keen that couples uh, and in dioceses and places where they live keep their evidence, and, you know, evidence of their wedding ceremonies. What was it that, how did they decide to make their vows? How, what did they do? How did they witness it? All of those things I think are hugely important as we come to learn more about the shape of, of God's love for us as church through the love of our mm -hmm. queer. You speak about uh, not our rushing things. Um, and we talk a lot here at Vine and Fig about how real change is slow change um, and that you can't change an institution as large as the Catholic Church overnight mm -hmm. um, without the risk of schism and splintering. But what do you think is a change uh, that the church could implement tomorrow uh, that would be a helpful and healthy first step? Hmm. <laughs> Gosh, I've never... I think any change issued suddenly like that, as you say, is the kind that produces reaction. Um, I think that little by little, you know, I don't know what is true in the diocese in which you live, uh, mass is growing uh, of people who are living their lives as gay Catholics in couples or singly or whatever, but honestly and openly and therefore are beginning to be able to bear witness to what they're about. And that's what it's about. Christianity is essentially a matter of witness. I'm honestly not sure what, uh, what change would look like, what a single act of change would look like. Of course, uh, ultimately, I hope that uh, it'll be possible for um, some papal document to mention en passant, of course, we no longer do that as we used to do. <laughs> You know, we, we no longer use the uh, Aristotelian um, deduction <laughs> concerning gay people as being uh, ob objectively disordered straight people. <laughs> uh, 
Um, it would be nice if they could. It'd be nice if they could mention that en passant in some in some document. You know, in a sense, let the for me the longer the ground the ground rules change, the faster the grounds will change. The more that parents and families in dioceses simply say this is unacceptable. We are not going to send our children to your schools if you carry on insisting on teaching them lies. I think yeah, that that's kind really of at the front lines in the pews where, um, where change happens. Yeah, but the front well, the pews are the front lines in this matter because it's because the people who are working out what it means to have gay family members, gay friends, uh, in all the practical senses, are the people in the pews. It's their kids who are coming up. Uh, it's their relatives whom they love who are being denied burial or whatever. Uh, or it's their friends who are being sacked from this or that job in uh, some school or some parish because they got married, whereas everybody had known about it beforehand. But while they weren't formally married, the pastor was able to pretend and it's when the, the parishioners just say uh, to the pastor, "Honey, this really won't do." <laughs> um, when you when you're, you're sacking you're sacking him merely because he's got married, like we we've no, his husband has has been. And I think that's something that I years. that Pat and I witnessed in Seattle that was really beautiful was um, a group of uh, gay and lesbians that were always there every oh. Sunday. Um, in the front pews and met at coffee hour afterwards. Um, and just uh, as a matter of like a, a statement, it's saying we are here and we're right. faithful. And I think that really, for me, it helped me understand that um, the church, the Catholic church isn't what I had assumed before embarking on RCIA. And it was just a, a beautiful sight to see. Yeah. And uh, amazing courage and perseverance by people who are just saying, Wait a second! I'm not going to let them pretend this isn't my church just because they they need to have some fake right, James, sort so of purity. If the Pope called for a synod on human sexuality and he calls you up again and he says, "James, I need some advice. Who are we going to invite to participate in this synod on sexuality to make sure that we get it right? Who are you going to tell him? What are you going to tell him that he needs <laughs> to consider?" <laughs> well, um, uh, I'm I'm not sure. Whether there will ever be such a synod, uh, let me say, and I'm pretty certain that I wouldn't get called. That up. was a very. Let's imagine um, that was a very polite way of, would, of inviting you I mean, first, yeah. and also asking who you want to bring along. Well, I mean, you know, in terms in English language terms, I, I just want to say something. In a certain sense, the really complicated issues to do with this are not the gay issues. This is something which I I want to uh, to make clear. Theologically speaking, dealing with the gay issue in the church is not a very difficult one. Psychologically, it's an enormously difficult one because of the uh, the density of closeted clergy. In other words, psychologically, it's, it's very difficult to talk about in a clerical group, whereas theologically, actually, it would be it's a pretty straightforward issue. I mean, much more straightforward, for instance, than discussions about um, divorce yeah. and remarriage which is genuinely a complex theological question to do with sacraments. Uh, and I, say, I think that's the first thing. That, that the really important and difficult and complicated issues in this sphere are to do with straight people, and I think now, interestingly, with trans people. Those which aren't really, I mean, trans people is not to do with sexuality at all, it's to do with, um, with being. I think that those are genuinely complicated uh, theological issues that require real experts, scientific experts, and so on. At this stage, with relation to the gay question, the science is pretty clear. This is just something that is. <laughs> it's not a pathology of any sort at all. It's a non-pathological minority variant in the human condition. Therefore, by definition, it's part of God's created order. So deal with it. Find out what it's for if you want to be Aristotelian. Um, so I I don't think you need much expertise with that. I think that just about anybody can get their head around that. Just about every family dealing with having a gay child gets around that. A huge number of kids in middle school are getting their head around that. This is not a very difficult question. <laughs> so there doesn't need to be much expertise about that. I, I think that the real expertise comes in the much more difficult issues to do with uh, with marriage, divorce, and as I say, trans uh, trans issues. So, I mean, experts on, on yeah, gay definitely. sexuality, of course, they would just need to invite some gay couples. They need to have uh, witness 
the witness of gay parents. They need to have the witness of children of gay parents because otherwise they spout nonsense like saying it is inherently violent for same-sex couples to be bringing up children, which we know is nonsense. The science knows it's nonsense. Any number of children will be happy to testify on behalf of their parents that it's nonsense. Um, so, curiously, I don't think that it's, this is a question about experts. I think this is a question about, uh, if you like, relatively easy banality, which we all know, because, you know, frankly, there is no teaching, properly speaking, about homosexuality in the in the church, and the reason is quite simple. The only teaching that there has been that has pretended to be about homosexuality has presumed that the only approach to it is as a deduction from a, an imagined universal heterosexuality, an intrinsic heterosexuality. So the moment you realize that there is such a thing as gay people and gay people are not in some way disordered straight people, then obviously it's going to become a first-person question, first-person plural question of how we those of us who live this rather glorious and fun reality of being gay, how we learn what is good for us and for others in our loving. That's something that you no doubt are doing. And you're able to bear witness about that to your friends. I don't, I don't, I don't think real experts are needed on that. Um, well, what I <laughs> found interesting that, that you, you want, but... said was... Um... <laughs> That the trans issue within the church uh, would be difficult, but you also said it, it was a matter of being, which I find uh, to be something so simple. Like they they just want to be themselves, uh, accepted for who they are. Um, do you think it's the the science and kind of the unknown that is causing it to be a larger issue that we would need experts to come in for? Oh, I think that I mean you know there are. There are genuine, there are genuine questions uh, about that. I mean, I, I I can't talk about this in the first person, so I, I really have no expertise. But I do talk to trans people, theologically, very uh, what's the word? Very acute uh, trans people about the kind of discussions that they have amongst themselves and for themselves, uh, and their following of the science as it develops to understand what. Uh, gender dysphoria or gender dysmorphia is um, and how they live it and what difference it makes to their understanding of who they are. So I think, yes, I think that the, the science is in the early stages, as it is in its early stages with all of this. Um, and But obviously, the question has been, from church authorities' point of view up till now, it has talked about a them without bothering to consult the them in question. It's been making deductions about them from its supposed starting point, which was what was so catastrophic about the the recent Vatican document um, called Male and Female, He Made Them, or something like that. It said it was about dialogue and then proceeded to lay down the lines in purely a prioristic ways <laughs> that showed a complete uh, failure to have entered into discussion with the real people who are living this reality and who are very often very sane, well-informed, not at all radical, certainly not hostile people. So, to, you know, when the church doesn't want to deal with something, it invents a, a paper tiger. In this case, it's invented a paper tiger called gender theory or something like that, gender ideology, sorry, um, which it then uses to attack everything that questions its own teaching. Well, that's frankly so silly uh, because... The only people you're, it's genuinely important for you to talk about are not the extremists who hold uh, radical uh, views that may hate the church. You want to talk about the real people who are living this as Catholic trans people, of whom there are any number, and who are slowly, gently, and with a good deal of information and support, working these things out. So... Catholicism is, as you know, a very intellectual faith, which it has huge emphasis on reason and philosophy. And we love to write, you know, uh, deep and heady books explaining, you know, all these various aspects of the faith, which is, you know, wonderful for those of us who love to live in our heads. But it's also this tremendously 
sacramental and experiential religion. So how do you think we can help the leaders of the church experience the goodness in queer relationships and identities in hopes of, of kind of helping them get to that place intellectually? Well, I think you're exactly right. Uh, the, it, the relational is prior to the intellectual. And I think that that's something that Pope Francis understands. That's something that you clearly understand. It's something that I understand. And that's something which is terrifying for people for whom the intellectual is uh, a form of protection from the relational because they need to have locked themselves into a box before they dare to relate to people, which is a particularly masculine uh, often, or particularly male, I should say, um, and very often, you know, a somewhat paranoid uh, form of being. Um, and one, unfortunately, very, very frequent in the higher clergy. It's perfect for the closet. So, I mean, I think that you carry on being fabulous and allow yourself to be fabulous in the company of people who are frightened of it. And you don't do it so as to frighten them, but so as maybe gently to tease them into being able to giggle at themselves. Because that's the, that's the solution. It's when, it's when people are able to giggle at themselves that we're finally set free. <laughs> so, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's the relational prior to the intellectual. It's things like that group of people that you described in Seattle. It's things like uh, you two going together to discuss things with your pastor or with the vicar general or whatever in a perfectly straightforward way and clearly not being concerned about your own status of faith or moral life, but about the church and the importance of being able to tell the truth for young people uh, rather than you know, the fact that you're dealing with a, a very conflicted, closeted, uh, a closeted uh, church official saying, yeah, 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 okay, that's just a fact of life. We've got to deal with that. We're not going to be, allow that to run us. We're just going to try and be as honest and straightforward as we are. And with a bit of luck, that will melt uh, people you deal with. But I think, I think that's right. I think it's that, that kind of witness. It's a, a non-resentful being sons or daughters of God. Do you think that we have any spiritual insights or gifts that uh, come with being gay? Yes. I mean, I think that one of the things that we all are slightly is slightly interstitial people. We haven't had entirely normal family uh, upbringings. So there's something about being a minority status, which I think is just great. It's what enables the world to have a little spite. Uh, we start to look at things in a slightly different ways. But also, and I think that this is true now in the life of the church, that we're in a vanguard position. Remember, everyone else is going through a huge crisis of faith about the church because of what's been revealed about it. Well all our adult lives, it's been hating us. And if we've been able to hold the faith and be confessors of the faith, even when it was doing that, then if you like, we're the vanguard who are going to be able to tell the truth and help create genuinely holy spaces rather than toxic spaces for the next generation. So I think that, uh, I think that yes, I think that you have an enormous amount to offer, and I hope I do as well, precisely through having become being a confessor. Confessor means someone who held the faith in a time of persecution. We have had our faith tested by having had to confess it at a time of persecution. That the persecution has effectively been done by people like ourselves, but who were just terrified of being who they are, is a sad reality. But the fact that now increasingly we're able to stand up and say, actually, no, I'm a, I'm a gay Catholic, and the faith is wonderful. It's true. And Jesus does love us. And the whole point of the sacraments is that they do enable us to do all sorts of things. They do empower us. We are becoming more than we thought we were through this life. I think that that is a, a wonderful sign of how uh, what seemed to be the margins, in fact, turns out to save the center and rebuild the center. So we've talked about how there are a lot of closeted gay priests out there and and definitely higher up in uh the clergy of the church as well. Um, if someone says to you, hey, we can't have priests coming out of the closet, like it's nobody's business anyway, what do you say to them? Um, I would say at the moment it's going to be very difficult for for priests to come out of the closet because they will be so frightened of uh, losing their friends, their support, uh, et cetera, et cetera, depending especially on which diocese they're in. 
ultimately, it's in everybody's interest that the leadership of our church as of any institution be people who are living honest lives. So anybody who is concerned, for instance, about the church's tendency to cover up on the child abuse issue should want honest gay clergy rather than clergy who can be blackmailed into covering up things that are far worse, which is what's been happening so far, which is what's been happening so far. I mean, the real problem that we is blackmailability leading to cover up. We don't want to have an institution in which our principal leaders are subject to what I believe the the Trump regime now has taught us as being a great Soviet gift of kompromat. We don't we don't want uh, blackmailable leaders. Why should we have? We're supposed to be a church of witnesses. So. Obviously, I don't think that anyone can be forced to come out, but I think that church authority has to, over time, make it possible for its own leadership to live honest lives so that they are not blackmailable. We've seen how catastrophic things are when people are frightened that they can be blackmailed into uh, into covering up this or that. So no more of that. We agree. <laughs> okay, so the next question. Queer Catholics often feel rather outside the church, um, and even as they remain faithfully inside, uh, what advice do you have for young queer people of the church that are trying to figure out if they still have any place within? I mean, they obviously do have a place within. It's the question of what's what's the place they're going to create for them and people they love. That's all. Uh, you know, don't don't ask don't ask what your church can do for you. Ask what you can do for your church. That's the uh, that's the thing. This is this is your your party. Make it a better party. I think that increasingly people are saying that, yeah, I'm not going to be chased out by these people who are playing these closeted games. We're going to try and create intentional spaces where we can share our faith as gay and lesbian people, take part in the ordinary life of the church, and also learn how to be genuinely charitable, how to do great things, how to stand up for those in greater need than ourselves. Because that's what no one can take away from you. No one can take away from you loving the poor, visiting those in prison, helping the sick, etc., etc., protecting migrants from... ICE or whatever, no one can take that away from you. So, you know, um, hypercharged Catholic faggotry surely includes having a certain edge for the marginalized. <laughs> uh, what's, what's your favorite part about being a priest and what's your favorite part about being gay? Oh, hmm. what's my favorite part about being a priest? Actually, I love presiding and preaching, particularly the preaching going with the presiding. I really love sinking into the as I prepare the, the gospel, finding finding what it is that uh, what is it that Jesus wants to make present about himself and his message, what is it he wants to give to people on this particular Sunday, um, and then attempting to have a place in that in sharing that. What do I like most about being gay? Gosh, there's so much. I mean, when you're when you're a kid and you're and young. We think of its disadvantages. And now I just think it's such a privilege. I have friends all over the place, amazing sharing network of people, amazing quizzical, slightly odd view uh, of things, uh, you know, because you look at it from different perspectives, but also just the, the beauty of men. So those are things I enjoy about being gay. What else should I enjoy? I don't know. I'm missing many gay genes. I don't have the interior designer gene. I don't have the... Uh, Broadway musical gene. I don't have the liturgy gene. I don't have the cooking gene. So, uh, oh, trust me. Uh, I know many gay men that are missing those genes. <laughs> I think it's a, <laughs> a false narrative that we've we placed on. <laughs> okay, good. Well, there we are. So, yeah, no, no, no. I think I uh, really. I I hit sixty last week, and it's just such a privilege. Just such a privilege. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, to be a, a gay man at this time, especially when it's possible to be open and honest and not be blackmailed and not frightened of having people hit you the whole time and so on and so forth. While it's tough being queer in the Catholic Church, being Catholic in the secular world, especially in the gay community, um, can also be tough. Um, it's often very taboo, shunned, and we're often looked at as an anomaly. Um, what is one sentence that you would say to those in the secular world who aren't approving or are confused as to why uh, 
we as queer individuals stay within the faith? Um, get over it, honey. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a good answer. That's a that's a good answer. Seriously, because they, you know, people feel that they need to have an intellectual reason to dislike uh, the Catholic Church because of all the awful things that it does, and that, they're perfectly right. But it's never the intellectual thing. In every generation, it's the long term, life lived testimony of real people who have discovered something true about the way Jesus is amongst us and builds us up and gives Himself to us. And that's the kind of thing that we've discovered because it's about love, like being gay is about love. And those two taken together are life projects. So people can witter on about this or that problem. They're like, oh, but the Spanish Inquisition, oh, but blah, 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 blah. blah. Ah, let them witter on about it. You're involved in a life project. Eventually, if they stick around long enough, they'll see that life projects are actually more worthwhile than they thought and will come to respect you. If all they want is a what you call a virtue signaling exercise. Well, then let them. Speaking of uh, life projects and, and love, um, we want to thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk to us today. Um, but Pat and I are getting married in February. And so we wanted, oh, how to, close. <laughs> we wanted to close by asking you, what advice do you have for us uh, in our marriage? Oh, God. Uh, you, need to ask, you need to ask someone who can uh, do that. So you need to ask someone who's who's got genuine experience of that. Um, but uh, always remember a third, um, a third, a real third in your life, whether a dog, a child, a shared project, something to take you out of the face to face. I think that's that's tremendously important, or some, something to allow your face to face to be mediated. I think that would be true in any loving relationship, isn't it? That's wonderful. Thank you. And and James, once again, thank you so much for taking this time to to talk with us. Uh, tell our listeners where they can find your work. Um, www.jamesallison, that's with one L in Allison uh, and one S in Allison, dot co dot uk. So what are we toasting this week, Jacob? Um, so today, uh, so we're recording this on the 16th of October, but it's National Pronouns Day. So toasting to all you trans, non-binary, and genderqueer folk out there living your true lives. Um, and to the babies who are still kind of in the closet, just know that we're out there supporting you. And uh, if you're not ready to announce your pronouns to the world, that is all right. Exactly. We are here for you. Um, yeah, and to the allies who affirm these trans uh, and queer lives um, by using correct pronouns. It's not that hard. Just give it a little try. And, uh, you know, affirming by using pronouns goes a long way. Absolutely. Well, uh, October is LGBT History Month, so I'm toasting Matthew Reamer and Leighton Brown. Together they run the Instagram account at LGBT underscore history. And it is easily one of my favorite social media accounts and pretty much the only one that I feel like I'm actually learning anything from. Uh, they do an incredible job posting photos and accompanying stories, especially stories about the POC leaders that have gotten the queer community this far. So make sure that you go and follow them if you're not already. All right, y'all, that is it for us. You can support the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts and you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash vineandfigco. If you like this interview, please consider sharing it with a friend. We think that there are a lot of folks out there who could really benefit from hearing from what Father James Allison said. We are also going to try and record more interviews like this in the future. So if you have any suggestions for who we should talk to, email us at vineandfigco at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, y'all. Bye. Father James Allison and left him on red. Like he didn't like the way that <laughs> description of the phone call went. He was like, bitch, you fucked that up. That is not what I told you. Mm-hmm.